I'm going to discuss the surgical management of advanced neuroendocrine tumors of the pancreas. Even though I intend to discuss surgery of this disease, I want to emphasize that a multidisciplinary approach is vital to bringing all the available treatment options together to achieve the best outcome for each individual patient. This means that we include a team of specialists to decide which form of treatment is best. Activity level and overall health of the patient, symptoms and specific tumor characteristics and location for each case alters that treatment algorithm. Pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors were introduced in another lecture in this series. To review, a main feature of the disease is that neuroendocrine tumors tend to follow a slow course in comparison to adenocarcinoma of the pancreas, which is more aggressive. This opens the door to a variety of courses of therapy based on where the tumors occur. Newer therapies are allowing us to treat this somewhat as a chronic disease and the result for patients is improved survival. Although these tumors in general are slow growing, there are some that will spread more quickly. But with close observation and advances in our treatment, we are able to treat tumors again and again if necessary. Unlike adenocarcinoma, patients with neuroendocrine tumors are often able to have surgery even if the tumor has spread to the liver. The first order of care for the patient with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors is to use medication to control the symptoms of any clinical syndromes that might occur on the basis of the functional tumors. The initial consideration for treating the cancer itself is whether the tumor or tumors are amenable to resection or surgery to remove them. We prolong patient survival in cases where we can offer surgery, but we need to be able to remove all or most of the tumor in order to make a difference. This is very different than the decision making for pancreatic adenocarcinoma in which any evidence of spread renders the cancer inoperable. Our talk today is mainly focused on advanced pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, which are either locally advanced and may involve surrounding structures or metastatic, which may present at the same time as the initial tumor or at a later time. The type of surgery recommended for the pancreas is based on where the tumor occurs within the pancreas. Laparoscopic or minimally invasive surgery with small incisions may be offered with smaller, less complex lesions and those that are likely benign. But a traditional approach is favored for the more locally advanced lesions. For locally advanced tumors, it is appropriate to consider resection of involved nearby organs or structures, including resection and reconstruction of some blood vessels if necessary. Initial resections are planned with an intent to cure unless the patient has significant metastatic tumor burden on presentation. Procedures with a goal to remove 90% of the tumor are called cytoreductive or debulking procedures. These may be combined with the resection or removal of the primary tumor within the pancreas. Some locations of tumors make it necessary to undergo more than one operation in order to remove all the tumor that can be removed. This is referred to as staged procedures. We will expand on that as we focus our discussion on the recurrent and metastatic disease. Metastasis to lymph nodes and liver are most common, but metastasis to bone or other sites can also be seen. Local recurrence is also quite common with these tumors and should be resected if possible. Because we know that we can help patients with surgery, surveillance is imperative to detect these tumors before symptoms arise and while the number of tumors or the tumor burden is manageable. History and physical alone may not be enough. Tumor markers or certain blood tests may be helpful in select cases where they were known to be elevated preoperatively before the initial pancreas surgery. Imaging with CT scan or MRI should be obtained three to 12 months following resection and then considered at six to 12 month intervals after the initial year following resection. I want to put particular emphasis on surveillance as we are now seeing evidence to support that surgical management of these tumors improves patient survival. Surgical and liver-directed therapy options are greater 
when disease is detected early. Several reports, especially over the last 10 years, now confirm that patients managed aggressively with surgical resection or liver-directed therapy have improved survival. Clearly, complete surgical resection or removal is preferred, but cytoreductive procedures to remove 90% or more of the disease is favored when a complete resection is not possible. Therapy for liver metastases may include resection or removal, ablation, or arterial-based regional therapies. These therapies must be selected on a case-by-case -case basis. Surgical resection of liver metastases may be accomplished with laparoscopic procedures or minimally invasive procedures in many instances. Surgery is beneficial for patients even when the tumors that spread to the liver are either large or may be affecting both sides of the liver as long as at least half of the liver um, re remains unaffected by disease. If both sides of the liver are affected, it may be necessary to treat one side during one operation and the other side at another procedure. A healthy liver is capable of regeneration so that if an area of liver is removed, the remaining liver will expand over the weeks following surgery to regain the same level of function as before the removal was done. After this regeneration, more treatments may be applied to the liver if necessary. Sometimes it may not be best to remove a tumor, but we can perform procedures to kill the tumor. These procedures are ablations. They are performed by heating the tumor or sometimes freezing the tumor. Ablations are performed with needles through the skin and sometimes with minimally invasive surgery to protect nearby structures during the treatment. The most common method of ablation is with thermal energy and this includes radiofrequency and microwave technologies. Combination procedures with resection of some lesions and ablation of others are also often indicated. Embolizations are treatments that treat directly to the blood supply of tumors. Using tubing that's passed through the blood vessels, similar to heart catheterizations, the radiologist can deliver small beads containing chemotherapy or radiation so that the treatment is delivered directly to the liver that contains the tumor. This therapy may be considered if innumerable metastases are present in one lobe of the liver. However, the treatment does have effects to the surrounding normal liver as well, so patients should be carefully selected in order to preserve their liver function. This therapy is not curative, but can slow disease progression and also lead to tumor regression. The liver surgeon, along with the rest of the multidisciplinary team, should be involved to decide which of these treatments is best based on where the tumors are located and how many are found. It is important to plan treatments based on the best way to maintain good liver function while treating the most amount of tumor possible. In the instance of asymptomatic patients with recurrent disease but low tumor burden and no progression, treatment with octreotide alone and close observation should be weighed against other treatment options. For example, patients with a small recurrence in a location that would require an extensive procedure may be best observed with intervention reserved in the instance of progression of disease. Some of these tumors will stay in a stable state for some time. The medical oncologist may choose to treat patients with more than just octreotide if the patient has significant symptoms bulky tumors, or rapidly progressive disease. There are some new agents that may show benefit for these patients and have shown anti-tumor effect with improved progression-free survival in recent studies. These are the biologically targeted agents. Some of the more aggressive tumors may warrant treatment with more conventional types of chemotherapy, such as platinum-based chemotherapy. Lastly, I'd like to briefly address where transplantation fits into this algorithm. In the instance of isolated hepatic metastases with a lengthy latent period, meaning that no new tumors are showing up in that time frame, uh, and this is, is done to try to ensure against 
disease outside the liver, in those instances, hepatic transplantation could be considered. This is not common. These patients must be very carefully selected to achieve the best possible patient outcomes, as well as to ensure for appropriate utilization of those uh, liver organs. There really are two important messages from this talk. The first is that we have many available options for the patient with advanced and metastatic pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. The second and most important is that aggressive surgical management should be offered to these patients as long as liver function can be preserved because we now have several studies that demonst demonstrate survival benefit for the patients who are treated surgically. The presence of metastasis, even when extensive, should not preclude a surgical evaluation by a specialized hepatobiliary surgeon to determine if the patient could be a candidate for one of these treatments.